In the 20th century, humanity survived two world wars, many local and civil wars. Many dictators appeared. Italy, Spain, Cambodia, Romania, Chile and other countries experienced the horror of leaderism and political repression. By far, the most powerful dictators of the 20th century were the Führer of Nazi Germany, Adolf Hitler, and the head of the Soviet Union, Joseph Stalin, who clashed in the 40s in the bloodiest confrontation that mankind has ever known. Adolf Hitler was born on April 20, 1889, in the family of customs official Alois Hitler and his wife Clara, in the Austrian town of Brno am Inn. Three children born in the family before Adolf died. Adolf and his younger sister Paula would be the only children to live to adulthood. The head of the family Alois Hitler was able to build a good career as an official, so the family was sufficiently financially secure. And in 1897, he moved to his own house near the city of Linz. Alois resigns, and six-year-old Adolf doesn't particularly like this, as his father is at home all the time and tries to instill discipline in his son. Willfulness of character will be manifested in the son of an official already in childhood, expressed in the struggle with the principles of his father and the inability to work in an orderly manner. Alois Hitler will die in just eight years, and Clara in twelve. At the age of seventeen, Adolf will be left to himself, and a rather important period will begin in his biography, associated with life in Vienna where his world view begins to form. Joseph Jugashvili was born on December 6, 1878, in the beautiful Caucasian city of Gori, Tiflis governorate in the Russian Empire. Father, Vissarion Jugashvili, is a shoemaker, cruel, drinking, beating his wife and son. Mother, Ekaterina from the Geladze family, was religious, and treated Joseph with care and love, including because the previous two children had died, although sometimes she also used cruel methods of parenting. Immediately, we find the difference from the Hitler family. Poverty. This word fully characterizes Stalin's childhood. A violent drunkard father, who received a small salary, like most in that small town, not seeing economic prospects in Gori, left to work in Tbilisi as a laborer. But this did not change the situation in Jugashvili's house. Ekaterina, who worked as a laundress, had to earn extra money as a seamstress and cleaner. The street also met Joseph with hostility. Teenagers united in groups and often fought with each other. But I must say that such a life did not break the future leader. At home, he opposed his father. On the street, he rebuffed his peers. Poverty and widespread violence, of course, left negative imprints on Stalin, but at the same time filled him with motivation to get out of this horror. In 1888, when Stalin was 10 years old, at the request of a pious mother who dreamed that her son would become a priest, he entered the Gori Theological School. After graduating from a public school at the age of 11, Hitler entered a high school in Linz. Young Adolf did not have that perseverance and desire to waste time on subjects that he didn't like and his report card was full of failures. It was also difficult to establish relations with classmates, and Adolf didn't strive for this too much. Alois Hitler wanted for his son a career as an official, similar to his own. On this basis, the father and son had a confrontation, since Adolf was not going to connect his life 
with the profession for the sake of daily bread. Even then he dreamed of doing art, seeking recognition. After the death of his father, there is almost no incentive to study, and the young man eventually drops out of school without receiving a certificate, and seriously wants to enter the Academy of Fine Arts in Vienna. After some time of walking around theaters, libraries, and simple idleness, Hitler goes to Vienna and fails the entrance exams. His mother died in 1907, which was a hard blow for Adolf. He returned to Linz, but later he went back to Vienna and unsuccessfully repeated his attempt to enter the academy. This made a stubborn individualist blame everyone but himself. What Adolf found interesting for himself, he studied on his own, in books. Sometimes he even asked his friend August Kubizek to read this or that book in order to discuss it together. In 1894, Joseph Djugashvili graduated with honors from the Gori Theological School. It should be noted that studying in Gori is characterized extremely positively. Stalin had excellent marks in almost all disciplines, and even for behavior, although outside of school he was a fighter. The priests evaluated him as a very capable, talented student, and therefore recommended him to the Tiflis Theological Seminary. In Tiflis, he was struck by the strictest discipline. Seminarians were allowed to go into the city for only one hour a day. Personal belongings of students were checked. Only certain books were allowed into the building. The administration and teachers demanded obligatory gestures of respect. Stalin still studied well, but over time the zeal for learning faded away, and dislike for all the seminary rules and priests grew. The best students of Georgian schools entered the seminary, and often their thirst for intellectual development began to go beyond the framework of the seminary course. Young people united in groups, read forbidden Hugo, Darwin, Marx, Lenin. The study was coming to an end. Joseph became more and more protesting, behaved rudely with teachers, hated the imperial authorities. He completed his last year at the Tiflis Seminary, but didn't show up for his final exams, essentially falling into the same uncertainty of his future as Adolf Hitler. The first thing to note is that Adolf Hitler, both in his youth and already becoming a public figure, was popular with women. However, the opinion of researchers about his intimate life is not so unambiguous. Georgi Klebnikov says that Hitler had his first intimate relationship at the age of 36, but this is more than author's speculation than an undisputable fact. We really know almost nothing about the Führer's relationship with the girls in his youth, except, for example, the memoirs of his friend August Kubizek, which indicates Hitler's sharply negative attitude towards prostitution and promiscuity. Yet, this is no proof of Hitler's monastic lifestyle, and it is likely that during his residence in Vienna, he had close relationships with the girls and even could use the services of girls of easy virtue. We know for sure about Adolf's first love, which caught him 16 years old back in Linz. According to Kubizek's memoirs, it was a strong, almost fanatical love for the blonde girl Stephanie, whom Hitler saw walking with her mother along the Landstrasse. An interesting fact is that for several years Hitler wrote poems about her, followed her, fantasized about marriage and life together, 
but never even had one conversation with Stephanie. In 1926, Adolf Hitler meets with 16-year-old Maria Reiter, but soon he will stop paying attention to the girl because of which she will try to commit suicide. It should also be said about the love relationship with his own niece, Angela Raubel, with whom they lived in the same apartment since 1929. A romance between a niece and an uncle really took place, but in 1931 Gailey shot herself. Motives and circumstances are unknown. Hitler took this death hard. He fell into depression, tormented himself with reproaches. The most famous companion of the Führer was Eva Braun, who after the death of Angela became his mistress. The age difference was 23 years. Eva eventually noticed her secondary importance in the life of Adolf and twice tried to commit suicide. On April 29, 1945, Eva Braun and Adolf Hitler got married. Both were dead the next day. Stalin's personal life is even more shrouded in rumors and speculation than Hitler's. And nevertheless, we can say that the leader of the USSR was also popular with women. This is evidenced by an impressive list of mistresses, cohabitants, illegitimate children. Let's dwell on the most interesting of them. Joseph Stalin was married twice. The first wife in 1906 was a young Georgian woman, the sister of one of Stalin's friends, Ekaterina Svanidze, from whom the son Yakov was born. Two months after giving birth, she died, and Stalin was rather seriously heartbroken. Stalin was repeatedly in exile. And there, of course, they couldn't do without love stories. In one of these exiles, in 1910-1911, Joseph lived in the house of the widow Maria Kuzakova, whose son Konstantin was born after the departure of her cohabitant. After the revolution, Maria received an apartment in Leningrad. Also, in 1910, Stalin lived in Baku, with party ally Stefania Petrovska, with whom he later asked the gendarmes for permission to marry. He was refused. 35-year-old Joseph, in other exile, had a relationship with a 14-year-old girl Lydia Periprigina. This didn't go unnoticed, and Stalin had to make a promise that he would marry a girl when she turned 16. Which, of course, didn't happen. By that time, the girl had already been pregnant twice. One of the children died. The second would be adopted by Lydia's future husband. The second and last wife of Stalin was Nadezhda Aliluyeva, who was 16 years old at the time the relationship began, and Stalin was 38. The marriage was long, two children were born in it, Vasily and Svetlana. Joseph, according to all sources and personal correspondence, loved his wife, and Nadezhda in turn loved her husband, and was often jealous of him. However, over time, Stalin paid less and less attention to his wife, and daughter Svetlana recalled that as her mother grew old, her father lost interest in her and almost certainly cheated on her. Nadezhda Aleluyeva committed suicide in 1932, becoming the last wife, but not the last woman of Stalin. Let's briefly talk about the hobbies of the two largest dictators of the 20th century. 
in his youth, Adolf Hitler, having his father's finances, had the opportunity to visit theaters often. Then he became seriously interested in music and the personality of Richard Wagner. Wagner was actually the only idol of Hitler in those years. Adolf not only revelled in Wagner's music, but also saw in him a person with indomitable faith in his confession, the greatest figure of the prophet of the German people. He admired his political activities. In the heroes of Wagner's operas, the young Hitler saw himself opposing the whole world and striving to the top. An important passion for Hitler was drawing. As it becomes clear, he didn't have outstanding abilities as an artist and sufficient perseverance for training. So he remained a self-taught artist without entering the academy. And yet he loved to draw. He painted buildings more often, fantasizing how one or another object could be transformed. Reading can be attributed to Hitler's favorite pastimes. He was fond of history and politics. The works of Georg von Schonerer and Karl Luger had a great influence on his views. The Führer himself claimed that during the five years of his life in Vienna he read a lot. However, for example, Hitler's biographer Joachim Fest points to the narrow focus of the literature read by Hitler, which was dictated by the ideology prevalent among the German bourgeoisie. Hitler was a vegetarian. According to many researchers, Adolf refused meat since 1931, after the death of his beloved niece Geli. An important role in the choice of vegetarianism was played by the same Richard Wagner, who also advocated the spread of vegetarian lifestyle. As in the case of the German dictator, in this video we will not delve into the political and ideological preferences of Joseph Jugashvili. Let's decide that Marxism can be safely called Stalin's main hobby, which determined his life path. Speaking about the Soviet leader, we can say with more confidence that reading books was a really important and favorite pastime for him. From his youth, he actively studied not only the works of Marxists, but also other foreign authors. Stalin also loved fiction, especially Russian classics. Joseph Stalin, of course, loved and highly appreciated the art of cinema and theater. Unfortunately, in his youth, unlike Hitler, he couldn't afford such an entertainment as going to theater performances or cinemas due to his financial situation. Later, after the revolution, he was pleased to attend theatrical performances, musical concerts and film screenings. Stalin's favorite was cinema. He watched a lot of movies, mostly with his party comrades. The Soviet leader devoted a lot of time to film production, defining it as an important industry for development, monitoring the release of films and making his own corrections and additions to the director's work. Stalin loved to play chess with his comrades, followed the chess sport of the Soviet Union and was personally acquainted with the best chess players. Also, Stalin's favorite game was billiards. A table for this game was present at each of his country houses. Summing up, we can say that the hobbies of both Stalin and Hitler were not anything extravagant. On the contrary, the dictators spent their leisure time in the same way as the majority of the urban intelligentsia of the late 19th and early 20th centuries who had the opportunity to visit theatres, cinemas, libraries. This concludes the first part of the comparison of the two dictators, but I am already preparing the second part, 
in which we will discuss the political views of Stalin and Hitler, their activities during the First World War, and the past to power. Thank you for watching.